Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. I'm Elaine Cha. Ike and Tina, Miles, Chuck, Nellie. St. Louis has been home to an outsized number of musicians big enough to answer to just one name. The city's contributions to popular music history go all the way back to the St. Louis tinfoil, the oldest existing sound recording that we can still access in modern times. The story of how we got from that tin foil to today is the one laid out in the exhibit, St. Louis Sound, which is in its final weeks of display at the Missouri History Museum. The last day to view the exhibit is Sunday, January 22nd. In August of 2021, the exhibit's content lead, historian Andrew Wanko, joined former host Sarah Fenske to talk about it. They started their conversation by digging into the history of that tin foil recording we just heard. So this is a fascinating artifact. It's actually the first thing people will see when they come into the gallery space. So Thomas Edison invented the phonograph in the fall of 1877. This is the first device to ever successfully record and play back sound. An incredible moment in terms of humans' interaction with music. You know, on a, on a worldwide scale, this is monumental. Just six months later, in June of 1878, one of these incredible new machines is being demonstrated in St. Louis at a 4th Street hat shop just around the corner from the old courthouse. Uh, And the fragile tinfoil recording made that day is now the oldest existing sound recording from America that we can hear in modern times. It's amazing that it has survived all this time. So the way the phonograph worked was uh, you hand cranked the device and a piece of tinfoil was wrapped around a cylinder. You sort of shouted your message uh, towards this cylinder and a little needle scratched the sound vibrations onto the tinfoil. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't get a piece of tinfoil off the wrap without wrinkling it all up uh, when I'm in my kitchen. So that's, it's amazing that this thing has survived because clearly these were incredibly fragile. Um, so we, we know some things about it and we don't know some things about it. Uh, it's likely that the voice was that of St. Louis newspaper journalist uh, Thomas Mason. The reason being because he owned one of the first 10 phonographs in existence. So he likely had the only one for hundreds of miles. He paid $95 for it, an incredible amount of money in 1877. Hmm. Uh, So he was probably demonstrating this machine at this 4th Street hat shop. You heard a little snippet of it there. You can hear uh, someone playing a cornet, and then it's followed by a man's voice reciting Old Mother Hubbard and uh, other nursery rhymes. Uh, He actually messes up the words to Old Mother Hubbard (laughs) while he's talking, so it's also the world's oldest blooper. (laughs) How difficult. That's amazing. And I guess part of what I find myself wondering, there were others of these machines out there. Do we know what led to this being preserved when so many similar recordings weren't? That's the part we don't know. There's a a huge portion of this thing's lifespan is sort of a mystery. (laughs) So somehow it ends up in the collections of a Michigan antique shop. And in the 1970s, this man's daughter donated it to the Museum of Innovation and Science that's based out of Schenectady, New York. The connection there being that that was the home of General Electric, which Thomas Edison helped found. So in the 1970s, she donates it to the museum as part of their Edison collection. And it wasn't until 2012 that we actually learned what was on this tinfoil, because if you had actually tried to play it back using a needle, it it would have destroyed it forever. Hmm. So in 2012, uh, researchers at uh, Berkeley Laboratories in California actually made a three-dimensional model of the tinfoil sound ridges and used that to reconstruct the sound that you actually just heard a moment ago. Go. So that's that's the amazing part of it. There are only two known playable quality tinfoils in the United States. The other one lives in the collections of the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, of course, Henry Ford was a close personal friend of Thomas Edison's, oh, which okay. explains how that one got there. Uh, but so that's it's really is a incredibly monumental artifact, you know, 
every recorded sound you and I have ever heard sort of answers to this thing as a common ancestor. That is a pretty amazing idea. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And the other idea that's amazing to me is that you got the idea, or the Missouri History Museum got the idea, that you could do an exhibit that would kind of take us from the tinfoil through all of these moments and sort of encompass all of this. This seems like an extraordinarily big piece of history to bite off here. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we. I don't think we realized how big of a bite we were taking, but it's a crucial one because St. Louis is a musical city on par with some of the greatest in the country. Um, you know, I, I really think St. Louis's musical legacy has been underappreciated on a national scale. When you look at how many genres that we touched, you know, we not just having popular musicians in these genres, but groundbreaking musicians, Scott Joplin, Tina Turner, Miles Davis. These were these were people who totally redefined genres, and people afterwards would have to answer to them for all time. You know, these are incredible musicians, and it goes beyond just the typical genres we often think of St. Louis being associated with, like ragtime and the blues. We have huge histories in country and western music, punk rock, hip hop long before Nelly. There was a lot of exciting things going on here. So we wanted this exhibit to sort of be a cross section, look across genres, across eras at all of the popular music St. Louis has produced. It's obvi obviously we couldn't, you know, with 10 galleries, we couldn't include everything, but we wanted a sort of St. Louis 101. If you know nothing about St. Louis music, this is the place where you can come and spend an hour and get that basic understanding that you need to really appreciate what this city has produced. Hmm. Well, we're going to play some of those tunes that the city helped produce and inspire. But before we get to that, I'm, I'm curious. I know there's so many different genres that you look at. I'm wondering if you found any commonalities or, or through lines that kind of connect big chunks of this history that you maybe hadn't thought of before you started this work. I think the through line in the St. Louis story is less about our particular sound and more about how we interact with the rest of the country geographically and culturally. You know, St. Louis has always been this sort of middle ground. We're sort of equal parts north and south, equal parts east and west, connected in every direction by river and rail. So no matter what genre you're talking about, St. Louis always has this connection because people were constantly coming here in waves and they were bringing music along with them. So we had all these homegrown sounds and stars here that were mixing with uh, sounds and stars from around the country into an even greater thing. You know, I, I think the idea of St. Louis being a confluence pops up time and time again throughout our history, but in few ways as large as with our music. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to think about it. And you've got, um, you know, you're not just telling people about these, these musicians and their lives. You also have some really wonderful artifacts that you've brought in for this. Yes. So we have almost 200 artifacts, again, dating all the way back to the St. Louis tinfoil is the earliest piece people will see, all the way through up to Nellie and the St. Lunatics. We have pieces from Mississippi Nights, which a lot of people are going to have very fond memories of. Uh, so across that spectrum, nearly 200 artifacts, uh, both from the Historical Society's collections, as well as more than 100 pieces that are on loan from the surrounding music community. We had tons and tons of people who contributed to this exhibit's success. Hmm. So one of these artifacts that you have on display, this is the piano from St. Louis blues musician Henry Townsend. Um, I understand his career stretched across nine decades. Give us a, a sense of what made this guy such a big deal. Absolutely. So one thing we wanted to do with the exhibit, we talk about those big name stars, but we also wanted to talk about some of those local legends who had such an important impact here, but maybe didn't quite get the, the national fame they deserved. Henry Townsend is definitely one of those people. He made his first recording in 1929 and recorded every single decade, all the way up until his death in 2006. Nine decades of recorded music from this person. Uh, the life he lived in St. Louis is fascinating. You know, plenty of people sing about living the blues life. This guy actually lived it. At age 11, he was a, a lookout for a, a bootleg whiskey operation. He worked as muscle for a debt collection agency in St. Louis. He was actually stabbed by a fellow musician who was jealous of his, his record deals. You know, an incredible life this person was living. And he stretches all the way up into modern times. You know, there are musicians in St. Louis today who remember going to his house and taking lessons from him at his piano that sat in his living room. And that piano is something that people will be able to see on display when they come to the gallery. Uh, his piano sat in his house for more than half a century. Huge blues names, Honey Boy Edwards, Alvin Young, Blood Heart, Johnny Johnson have all practiced on its keys. And one of my favorite things about it is he actually labeled each key in permanent marker because he would use the piano to give lessons to people and to teach his young son, Alonzo, how to play. Wow. Yeah. What a great little learning technique there. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm kind of mad my piano uh, teacher never thought of yeah. that. <laughs> now, for people who aren't familiar with Henry Townsend, we want to play an example. And obviously, 
obviously this career spanned like 90 years there or 80 years. Uh, this is just one example. This is from the 1980s. It's called Bad Luck Dice. I've lost all I had And there ain't no way for me to win Lost all that I had There ain't no way for me to win So it ain't no use to put it in my mind To try that same old game again And that is Henry Townsend. That's his song, Bad Luck Dice. Boy, what a great example of the St. Louis blues. Absolutely. The piano technique he's using there, those sort of melancholy rolls, that is a a style of piano that is particular to St. Louis. He's one of many people who could do it. Roosevelt Sykes, uh, Henry Brown, there were a, a number of other blues musicians playing in that style. And it's just so beautiful and sort of slow river rolling sound. I love it. We're listening back this hour to Sarah Fenske's conversation with Andrew Wonko, the public historian and content lead for St. Louis Sound. The exhibit is on display at the Missouri History Museum until Sunday, January 22nd. We'll continue the conversation after a short break. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. This hour, we're listening to former host Sarah Fenske's 2021 conversation with the exhibit's content lead, historian Andrew Wonko. Now, Andrew, St. Louis has been home to an outsized number of musicians, but perhaps none bigger than Tina Turner. Yeah, yeah. Talk about a name, another name that you you don't even need her last name. Tina, Tina. is Tina, <laughs> uh, and the story of Tina Turner is fascinating because she covers such a wide um, a wide array of time. She reinvented herself multiple times, and she's just this huge figure that keeps popping up throughout popular music. Um, her story really begins with Ike Turner moving his band to St. Louis. Ike Turner was a Clarksdale, Mississippi native, and in 1954, looking for better prospects, he moved his band, the Kings of Rhythm, up to East St. Louis, where he took up a residency. Uh, At the exact same time, Tina Turner was a young girl growing up in rural uh, western Tennessee, and she followed her mother up to St. Louis, where she um, started going out to a lot of the city's nightclubs with her sister. Mm -hmm. At East St. Louis's Club Manhattan, she was watching Ike Turner's band play one night, uh, and she decided to jump up on stage unannounced and start singing. He he immediately was blown away and he invites her to join the band as a backup vocalist. And so uh, in 1960 is when she first takes the main microphone. They were actually recording at Technosonic Studios in Brentwood when the head vocalist Art Lasseter failed to show up for a recording session that day. They took Tina from the back. She wasn't even Tina then. She was still a uh, little anime Bullock was, was the name she went by. Uh, they took her from the back and put her up front and recorded A Fool in Love. It became the very first first single that uh, the Ike and Tina Turner Review put out. The record label owner, Juggy Murray, described her voice as screaming dirt, uh, which is which is so visual to me. It um, doesn't sound like a compliment, yeah. and yet <laughs> it kind of is. But when you hear Tina's voice, that gritty sound, nobody else was doing that at the time. Uh, this was 1960. This was this was before a lot of the big heavy hitter vocalists of the, the later 60s, before the electric blues really takes off in the late 60s. So she was really at the cutting edge of a whole new sound and it's a fascinating song so talking about a fool in love we can't talk about a fool in love and not play part of a fool in love so let's go to that this is a fool in love uh, by ike and tina turner there's something on my mind won't somebody please please tell me what's wrong you just a fool you know you're in He's got me smiling, and I should be ashamed. Got me loving. 
So that is Tina Turner, of course, um, <laughs> with lead vocals on A Fool in Love. That was really the first song they recorded together. That was the first big hit single that featured Tina Turner as the head vocalist. And from that moment, you know, it's funny, Ike Turner actually thought of that recording as a demo that they would later come back and add Art Lasseter in as the main vocalist. And Juggy Murray, the record label owner, said, are you crazy? This is gold. Uh, and of course, he was proven right with the with the career that followed. You know, Ike and Tina Turner would put out more than 60 singles from Fool, A Fool in Love all the way up through 1976, when after years of, of course, everybody knows the story that Ike Turner uh, and, and you know, their, their shared life on stage was soaring, but their life outside of the stage was much different. After years of physical and verbal abuse from Ike Turner, in 1976, Tina Turner walks away and never looks back. Mm -hmm. She famously said she had 36 cents and a mobile station gas card in her pocket, but she would reinvent herself as the electrified hair, leather jacket wearing queen of the MTV generation, you know, starting a, a you know, even bigger move into the stratosphere. And Private Dancer, her album in 1984, would sell more than 20 million copies. Hmm. She's such a legend, and I know St. Louis always likes to claim her. And it sounds like we have some good reason to claim her. Um, it seems like if she hadn't maybe heard the music that was happening in the clubs that she was frequenting, even beyond running into Ike, this was just an indelible influence on her style. And we, we talk a lot about that in the exhibit. You know, when you see these big names like Tina Turner and Chuck Berry, they always had a context around them that often gets lost in their superstardom. But it really was the world of you know, particularly the clubs of East St. Louis and North St. Louis. Uh, they called uh, Broadway Street in East St. Louis, East Boogie, because there were so many clubs lined up one after another. And it was in these places that a lot of these bands were being were forming these sounds for the first time. You know, Ike Turner sort of became the son to a solar system of artists that, that flocked to East St. Louis. Little Milton Campbell, Albert King, who is a massive blues influence, you know, one of the, one of the head figures of the electric blues scene of the 1960s. They all came here sort of following Ike Turner's lead and created this microcosm of blues and R&B music that was going on here. Hmm. So these mus musicians are, are celebrated in this exhibit. It's interesting thinking about how the spaces uh, that they played and where they met and heard each other, that these are also so key to the development. You mentioned you have some artifact from Mississippi Nights. That's a club I yes. know a lot of people <laughs> yeah. remember. Yes, so certainly Mississippi Nights is going to be a trip down memory lane for plenty of people. Uh, from 1979 until 2007, it was the mid-sized music venue in St. Louis. A lot of people probably initially think of it as a rock and roll club, but when you see, we have a list in the exhibit of 300 of the biggest shows that ever happened at Mississippi Nights. Mm -hmm. When you see these shows, it pretty quickly dispels that notion. They had everyone at Mississippi Nights. Uh, Nirvana's only St. Louis show was at Mississippi Nights in 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, Toots and the Maytals, Sir Mix-a-Lot played Mississippi Nights. All sorts of people. Kenny G played <laughs> Mississippi Nights. But we have the Mississippi Nights sign that was built into the brick wall on the exterior of the building. A lot of people are going to remember lining up to get into shows right next to that sign. We have a piece, original piece of the bar top and a piece of the stage floor and the music manager Andy Mayberry's personal jacket that he wore while he was uh, uh, employed at Mississippi Nights. So a lot of really cool pieces there. Boy, those are some great artifacts. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's one I think anybody can access that, anybody at least living here at the time who liked music. That club was just, man, people still talk about that so much to this day. I want to talk about some more obscure aspects of St. Louis music and you really get into this here. Did you have specialized help to sort of figure out, okay, here are the ones that these might not be obvious, but these were a big deal. Yeah, so I mentioned the community effort that this exhibit truly represents. Every exhibit we do is a result of teamwork between the institution and the wider community, but this one took that to new heights. I had meetings with hundreds of different people who specialized in these local, very specific genres and areas. You know, many of them were living through this themselves, so I was getting this information firsthand from the people who actually lived it. Easily one of the most fun exhibits I have ever worked on. Get to hang out with yeah. music people. <laughs> yeah, yeah all, all the time. And people were so generous. They had, you know, these treasured objects that they were so excited to show me. I think because it's a it's a common refrain throughout the St. Louis music community that we don't get enough attention for the incredible music here. People are, are hungry to see St. Louis uh, being shown under the spotlight. So one good example of this, this more obscure stuff that actually had a big impact for people who know about music, this is the Welders. This is an all female St. Louis punk band from the 1970s. I'm going to play a, just a bit of one of their songs. This song is called Pervert, and they spell it out. It's P-E-R-V-E-R-T.
a low-down rodent <laughs> at best. That is pervert from the welders. Andrew, who were these girls? Yeah, so when you talk about punk rock, pretty much everybody initially thinks of New York with the Ramones and CBGBs, or they think of London with the Sex Pistols. It's very rare that you think about the earliest moments of punk rock and the Midwest. It's just not something often talked about. But when you dive in a little bit deeper, you find out we had that same subculture happening right here. So the Welders were an all-female punk band that formed in 1975 right here in St. Louis. Uh, those, those voices you're hearing are teenagers. When they first formed, none of them even even had driver's licenses. Wow. They were that young. And uh, they formed in 1975. That is before the Ramones or The Clash put out their first album. Like these, they are at the cutting edge of punk rock music. And it's this fascinating band because, you know, beyond the people who were in that, that small St. Louis punk rock scene that was happening, they're almost completely unknown. They, they never actually put out a record while they were a band in the 70s. They were only around for a couple of years and then that was it. You know, they, they <laughs> went on to college and, and all all those, all those sorts of things. But for the people who were around at that moment, you have no idea how many people I talked to who said, you've got to talk to the welders. It, they're, wow. they're the coolest band. They're like, And when you see them, when you come to the exhibit, we have stage clothing from all four of the members on display. It's sort of equal parts like thrift shop, find homemade clothing with just the, you know, this campy, wonderful flavor to it. And they were so confident. Like you listen to these songs they're writing. They're, they're in the middle of what was then a very male dominated world. Early punk rock was very- uh, For <laughs> so, sure. Sure, yes. that's the understatement. <laughs> yeah, and, and here they are up on stage, and they were they famously at their shows, if they had an unresponsive crowd, they would scream at them, is this an audience or an oil painting? <laughs> <laughs> I love these yeah. girls. They sound like the most amazing teenage girls in the world. <laughs> what happened to them? They went to college? I mean, are they now just hiding amongst us? Just, yeah, just, you the, know. the welders exist amongst us. And that, that's the most fun of all this, is that I get to meet these people who are, who are still around and doing really interesting things. Um, so the welders were around for a handful of years. Their music manager had actually gotten them studio time to put out what would be their first record. Uh, he traded some time with the record studio in exchange for free advertisement in the music newsletter that he ran. Because people forget how hard it was just to get studio time. You know, these yeah. girls don't have money. They're high schoolers. Uh, and so they actually recorded the songs you hear there, but then soon after his music newsletter folded and the record was never released. The, the master tapes were lost and it, by the studio, they were presumably recorded over. So the song you're actually hearing there was remastered off of a sort of moldy old cassette tape that was given to one of the girls at their 1970s recording. In 2010, Jason Ross, a local record label owner, actually released the Welders material for the very first time. So it's amazing that we're able to hear this stuff because it, it was presumably lost for all time uh, and here here we are listening to them now. Wow, what a story. Uh, we're talking today to Andrew Wonko. Um, he's with the Missouri History Museum. St. Louis Sound opens this Saturday. It's got stories of people you've heard of, stories of people you probably haven't heard of but should have heard of, um, and that's a great example there with the welders. Um, now, a lot of people think about St. Louis hip-hop. They think about Nelly and the Lunatics. You make a case that the city had a lot of hip-hop culture going on before that, um, and you introduce people to Dangerous D. Yes. Who was Dangerous D? <laughs> Absolutely. So hip hop, similar to punk rock, these were two musical styles that both rose in the 1970s sort of outside the established music genre world. Uh, they were, you know, radio stations would not touch them. They were totally toxic. And when you think about hip hop, you typically think of New York, East Coast versus West Coast, New York or Los Angeles. But similarly, that culture was in St. Louis from the earliest moments. Uh, actually, Jim Gates, who was a owner of East St. Louis, Louis radio station WESL was the first person to ever play the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight on the air in 1979. He's regularly talked about, um, you know, Joe Robinson, the founder of Sugar Hill Records, openly talks about how this is true. Hmm. Uh, and it's incredible, you know, you think of that being a New York song, and here we are in the middle of the Midwest playing it for the first time. So we had all these exciting things going on, but very little of St. Louis's early hip hop made it onto record because people were looking to New York and Los Angeles for all of the rising stars. But the, one of the earliest hip hop records was put out by D DJ Charlie Chan and MC Dangerous D, who were two University City High School students uh, <laughs> who walked into Vintage Vinyl one day and demanded that they finance a record of theirs. And uh, Tom Ray and Lou Price, the 
owners of Vintage Vinyl were so impressed by their confidence that they agreed to do it. I was, <laughs> it was <laughs> okay, I just did a double yeah. take there. Wow, that worked. So this was in 1986. Uh, so this is, again, one of the earliest releases by a St. Louis hip-hop artist. Dangerous D, you know, th they produced a couple thousand copies of the actual record. It had some local, regional play, but it never really made it too far beyond. But this is, you know, more than a decade before Nelly sort of puts St. Louis hip-hop on the map in a national way. Already this exciting stuff is happening here. Uh, Dangerous D unfortunately passed away in the mid-90s, but DJ Charlie Chan has gone on to a huge career. He's actually mm -hmm. the DJ for Daryl McDaniels of Run DMC. Uh, so he's since continued in the hip-hop world in a very big way. But it's a fascinating record. Uh, the, the cool, fuzzed-out reverb guitar was apparently played by one of Vintage Vinyl's employees on the, on the spot that day. Wow, they really <laughs> put it all into this. I, I'm going to play a track by Dangerous D. This is Power of Soul. Is mm -hmm. this from that same first record? This is the same first record that I just mentioned. This, so this is 1986 St. Louis Hip Hop. Wow, and these guys <laughs> brought this into being by basically telling Vintage Vinyl's owners that they had to. I love that story. <laughs> Let's play Power of Soul. Joints jumping, everybody getting up from coast to coast. And so was as you shoot with the holy ghost. You just free to the beat. Say what to the cat. Wave your hands left to right and go shake your butt. Everybody gets stupid, lose control, and just go with the flow of the power of soul. Oh, oh, oh. Good God, ain't it fucking now? And that is Power of Soul. Boy, that's a that's a very early hip hop track there. Do you see a through line kind of connecting that early effort to Nelly and, and the more prominent stuff that would come out of St. Louis in a decade later? Well that's the thing. So St. Louis has all of these all of these hip hop artists that are doing fascinating things locally. Um, but nobody is really looking here until Nelly. And at, the, at that moment, obviously St. Louis blows up huge. Uh, this what they call the St. Louis bounce, the sort of uh, you know, Midwestern flavor the children's nursery rhymes mixed in, the heavy bouncing beats. Nelly and the St. Lunatics sort of pioneer that, but then of course a whole bunch of artists come out afterwards. He sort of opens the floodgates to all of these record executives coming here looking for the next Nelly. So you get Chingy and Jaquan, Jibs and Huey, all in, like these are all top 10 Billboard hit artists that come out in a span of like four or five years. So it's great to see St. Louis did finally get the, the sort of recognition for the hip hop culture that we do have, but it, it pre dates Nelly by a number of decades. Hmm. So that hip hop culture is still going strong. And yet at the same time, I imagine there's other things in St. Louis that have kind of, you know, are, are percolating along. I mean, do you have any sense of as you look to the future, what do you see as the thing that's on the horizon that could end up blowing up next? Yeah, it's always so tough to predict the, the future of music because it seems to be changing so rapidly all the time. But I know looking backwards at St. Louis, we were always sort of on the cutting edge of of a lot of things, even if it wasn't always noticed in its own moment, stuff has always been happening here. We've always had a connection to much bigger things or have been instrumental in producing those much bigger things. So I think there is going to be no shortage of great St. Louis music to come in the future because we still have that strong musical, you know, community that I've, I've talked a little bit about, you know, hundreds of people helped me with this and I saw no shortage of generosity. I was invited into people's houses before the pandemic started and you can do that sort of thing. Uh, but people, people were just so kind and so excited to talk about this city and its legacy. So I think the future is very bright for St. Louis music. Hmm. And one of the things I love most about anytime you start talking music with people, we all have such a personal perspective on this. You ask anybody for their favorite piece of music, they might feel really strongly about that and it's just so subjective in some ways so we asked our listeners if they had any particular st louis based acts that they'd been a big fan of and our listener david shared on our st louis on the air facebook page his favorite st louis band is mu330 this is an american ska punk band i want to play just a little bit from one of the songs he suggested this is kkk highway
That is the St. Louis band MU330. We want to thank our listener David for recommending this, this KKK Highway. And Andrew, part of what I thought made this sort of important to talk about is, A, this is ripped from the headlines, right? The KKK ended up adopting a stretch of I-55. But also, music can be so political. Absolutely. Yeah, that that, uh, takes me back to high school right there. You remember that song? (laughs) Yeah, so MU330, uh, they were named after the St. Louis University High School music class where they all met together for the first time. And that's one of a number of sort of ska punk bands that come up in St. Louis in the 90s. The other one is obviously the huge band, The Urge which has a massive local following. But that's, yeah, so the story of the, the KKK adopts a stretch of Interstate 55, I think it was it 2001, right around there. Um, and it ended up being this big battle over could you could a hate group adopt a highway? Yeah. And they ended up renaming it the Rosa Parks Highway. It's, so it's this fascinating look at, you know, pop music combining political, uh, this very localized uh, debate that's going on. They have another wonderful song called Hoosier Love, which talks about that oh so St. Louis of things, the Hoosier, which is this fascinating local name that we have, you know, elsewhere Hoosier means something entirely different. If you go to Indiana, that's a, that's a compliment. But here it's this, uh, it's this interesting sort of, uh, you know, almost like redneck, but much more Mm -hmm. urban sort of person. Uh, So I I just love when bands are tying in these local references. It's so fascinating. And again, St. Louis just has this culture and music is such a part of that culture and identity identity of the city. And so that that's, like I said, that takes me back right there. And we're hoping that's what's going to happen with people in this exhibit. No matter if it was Albert King or MU330, no matter who your musician was, when you see them in this exhibit, you're going to go back and realize all over again why you love this music so much. You know, it's funny. We started out this conversation where I was talking about just the hubris that goes into, you're going to get a century and a half of popular music into one museum exhibit. But really, by telling the story of St. Louis music, you're telling the story of St. Louis, too. It's an even bigger story. His, historians love to sort of compartmentalize things into, well, that that's immigrant history, or that's food history, or that's baseball history. History. But in reality, it's never so clean cut. Music history, St. Louis music history, is St. Louis history. When you go through this exhibit, you're going to be learning about musicians and songs, but you're also going to be learning about race and ethnicity. You're going to be learning about fashions, local n- neighborhoods, these the places and the radio stations where this all happened. All of that context that is the wider St. Louis story. We want to make sure that that is just as celebrated and just as a, par- a part of this uh, fascinating exhibit. You mentioned a couple times the challenges of fitting all of this into one very small space. This gallery is about the size of a high school swimming pool, just a little oh bit goodness. bigger. Yeah, and we're trying to cram almost 200 artifacts and more than a century of history in there. The downside to all that is there are going to be moments where very worthy musicians got minimized or left out completely. But that's the thing. We weren't trying to create a list of the most important musicians or even a hall of fame. This is more, we tried to think of this exhibit almost like a really wonderful album. You've got Mm -hmm. some greatest hits, you've got some deeper cuts, even a novelty tune or two. It's a sampler platter of St. Louis music, so then you can go out and learn more on your own. You can you can find these stories out there and you can have that base knowledge so you can experience the city in an even bigger way. That was Sarah Fenske's 2021 conversation with Andrew Wonko, the public historian and content lead for St. Louis Sound. The exhibit is on display at the Missouri History Museum until Sunday, January 22nd. Admission is free. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Alex Hoyer is our executive producer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. 
St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.